<laughs> Lazzaroni podcasters, literati. Seriously. Right. Scum and awful of society. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the 17th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Thursday, 3rd of December 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We take a second, more detailed look at Marx's concept of the lumpen proletariat, which we initially covered in the previous episode. This week I have the new patron, G, to thank. I'll be releasing part 6 of the Fight Like an Animal series on Patreon later this week, so if that floats your boat, head on over and throw me a few bob. Their reading group series vote is also ending this week, so do make sure to vote. It looks like Eric Olwyn writes, Understanding Class might even manage to win it this time. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. Before we go on with Chapter 5, which is Bonaparte versus the National Assembly, last week... Esri and Sophia were listening, and maybe some other members of the panel, previous members of the panel, when we went through Marx's description of the lumpen proletariat, some people think that we didn't really do a proper critique of Marx's class analysis here. Esri or Sophia, do one of you two want to lay in here because you really wanted to talk about this section here I have highlighted? Yeah, because like... I think uh, so. Kyle and I were talking earlier about how, like, probably the fir- like everything up through the third chapter, where he's you know dunking on social democrats, is probably just the best marks that I've read. And I and Kyle, I think I speak for you when and yeah, saying that it's too. fantastic. Yeah, chapter four is mainly historical analysis. You know, whatever. Uh, chapter five, I've never seen marks like fail so spectacularly at the thing that I read him for, which is a sober class analysis. And it's really about the lumpen proletariat. And I agree with part of what you were saying last time that he's probably like, you know, signaling at Bakunin or, you know, people that had a lot of kind of hopes for the revolutionary lumpen proletariat at that time but just what's on the paper, you know what I mean? This is a fucking conspiracy theory. He sounds like Alex Jones. He sounds like Alex Jones. These these lumpen proletariat, they're going to be led by a Bonapartist agent. They're going to put water <laughs> in the frogs that make them gay. Yeah. And vagabonds, and discharged soldiers, and escaped galley slaves, and swindlers, and pimps, and <laughs> literati, and organ grinders. And they're going to put sodium chloride in our DNA and <laughs> turn us an anti super soldier. You know, whatever. Like it's the it's the being led by the Bonapartist agent that was like Yeah. I know that this might sound strange, but that was the most shocking to me because I knew he hated the love of proletariat. I knew he could be a little bit of an asshole, let's be real. But I wasn't expecting him to be like to, to sound like that. That sounds crazy. You know it's what that, I mean? Well, it sounds unhinged. And it's been a long time since I've listened to the Mike Duncan you know, sections on, on, on uh, you know, Bonapartism and, and all that jazz. So maybe I don't remember it properly. I don't remember much about all this. I don't even really remember much about the Society of December 10th. I mean, I feel like Duncan at least makes a note that Marx isn't at his most. Uh, that's what I remember. I don't think that's too hard of a judgment, is it? Is it too harsh? I just, I felt like you all were soft on Marx just because you wanted to bring out his kind of thought process, which... I like that you're explicating his thought process. I just think that this lines up with the moralism of the classical work- workers' movement, like one to one, right? Essentially, it's um, something we have to overcome in Marxism, in my opinion. Yeah, and yeah, maybe like I think Derek brought this up last time, like you know, going all in on the lumpen as a response isn't oh, that's just accurate yeah. either. My dad was a Christian. I'm a Satanist. You know, that's that's simply <laughs> keeping the framework and inverting the values, but like. Right. If you, in the lumpen proletariat, you're going to put like pimps and in, in other places, he puts, you know, sex workers, you know, so-called prostitutes. Like he puts them in the same category. That's not really class analysis. <laughs> nope. No, but I think it is like super moral, but 
I think he could you could use it as a class category if you like took out the moralism. Like yeah, I mean they don't they don't work, you know. You can they don't use... do productive they don't do productive labor, but they do beg. It is like it is it's not like it's not work. You go so on the train the here in London. And... It's not or, or... it's super under theorized. Like give But me they don't work for somebody. Proletariat based on what you, we have here. It's basically anyone that's like excluded from the wage relation here it's like yeah like you were saying like it's kind of confused like yeah it includes brothel keepers i mean that's a that's bourgeoisie like i'd say yeah it's just ramming together people that make their living scamming the proletariat and like subjugating and exploiting of other lumpen you know what i mean and like you say, like some of these are small property holders. They're not even like really proles. And even if you're sympathetic to like small proprietarians that are like low income and illegal or black market, you know, you can't just have the same analysis for brothel keepers and, you know, the workers in the brothel. Like it just doesn't fucking make sense. Yeah. Like, you're no. totally letting the law call the shot. It's like sex workers make some kind of like, I mean, they do make money and there is like exploitation there if they have a pimp or, or a madame or whatever. Se- sex, sex workers are exploited as shit. Yeah, but the, the, point, the point here is as well, well, I do like, well, no one is objected to here as literati. <laughs> Let that be noted. <laughs> but like... <laughs> I, I think this has bad implications for Verso Bucks. Well, fucking right. So, but what I, what I would say here is that he did. he is not saying that like all pickpockets are all like galley slaves i don't know if he is this what he is saying that these are is he saying like all of the lumpen backed him or there was like large segments of lumpen backing him i mean uh, somewhere here he says that bonaparte is essentially the political form of the lumpen proletariat like that's the the chief the chief of the lumpen proletariat like in so many words that's like the class expression in political terms is this you might say anti-political kind of support of a, you know, of a Bonaparte. That's the expression of the lumpen proletariat. He's not distinguishing between petty bourgeoisie that are like, you know, and then let's be real, petty bourgeoisie and organized crime are like, you know, Carl Weathers predator handshake. Like, you know, they're usually kind of hand in hand. Like, I don't know small business people that survive that don't like skate a lot of taxes. It's really that kind of thing more so than, and you were good about this last time. It's really that kind of thing more so than, than the lumpen proles proper that go for the Bonaparte. Like if we're going to even use Trump as a highly like far away example, it is so much less, you know, the the pimps and the pushers and the prostitutes, you know, like it's so much less those people that uh, went in for Trump. I think you said that those people are more likely actually to be like (laughs) the grifter like the, the, the grifter political class m- more so than the the base which i think is true <laughs> like i think that's actually true but th- their base is the petty bourgeoisie and and you made the comparison to fascism as well right the- like think of the people who who the fa- to really get into trump and all the like the weird right-wing militia types and stuff like that they're mostly pbs but like i don't know like they're also just like poor racists the PB just is not big enough to to explain the mass that's behind no, Trump. You're it's just right. Not. It's, a, it's a coalition between racist white workers and PBs, and it's obviously not all PBs go for Trump either. But like the kind of PBs who can like afford a big truck and a McMansion in the suburbs and call themselves cowboys and LARP and malicious and harass people on the border. Calgarians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or even just like coffee shop owners, or you know small businesses you know like printer shops like those type of people are probably heavily trump supporters but they're probably also heavily racist Same people. like yeah but like uh, yeah I, I know but i'm just saying that that's not that there's not that many pe- petty bourgeois but when we get to like, like looking here at uh, uh, let's go through the list then of all these people i want to so, clarify though i think in the, you're underestimating how many pb are in the in the u.s yeah because there's like that whole you know post-war settler compact to make like a middle class that and a lot of the a lot of the union stuff is demolished but there's still like pb in the u.s P- people who wh- whose families made made it well you know during the post-war compromise and were able to maintain their wealth their kids are probably suffering but those 
you know, Gen X to boomer generation people who have maintained their wealth and maybe some some of their kids who inherited that and are, you know, alt-right adjacent kind of brats. Those are kind of the, the PBs we're talking about here. And there's plenty of them. It, there's, it's, a shrinking, yeah. it's a shrinking demographic, but there's still a lot. But like, are, 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 is, is petty bourgeois not just to, me- it's not, is it not more like a measure of what type of, it's not just an income-based description. It's a production-based right. description. And yeah, like, there's just not enough shopkeepers in fucking America to, to, be 20, to be 30% or 20% of the vote. Like half of Trump's people are just Republicans and half of them are fucking probably diehard fucking racists. Like there's just not enough PB diehard fucking racists out there to be 20% of the population. Yeah, so I, we should, we should, we should uh, like do some, yeah, do, we should do some numbers on this. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. I think it may be interesting to go through the actual things who he, who he says are in this rump and proletariat and see yeah. do we agree or disagree with yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I think some of these we may have a, a hard time analyzing, such as, like, like what's our take on the class nature of Lazzaroni? Well, like, la- <laughs> well, like, la- like Lazzaroni of- are, like, Lazzaroni are, like, kind of uh, beggars from Naples. That's yeah. who they are. Yeah. You know, like... What, would, what's would, the class content of tricksters? Would we say that we would put like people who are like tricksters pickpockets into the lumpen. Yeah, that that, that makes if gonna, sense. If we're going to use the category lumpen, I think it's there is something built into it that's moralistic. But if we're going to try to put that aside because exploitation has moralistic content too, but we try to put that aside as Marxist, right? So the, the lumpen proletariat are people that proles that prey on other proles. Normally they prey on proles that the proper proletariat that are in the circuit of the wage form. So like Johnny, the plumber comes home from work and the pickpocket runs his pockets and gets the precious, you know, labor power wages. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, It's probably like one of those. I mean, if you like make your living uh, through um, stealing, then uh, I don't think that's, yeah, it's not proletarian. Strictly speaking, because you don't have work for a wage. I mean, it depends how you define proletarian, right? The whole concept of lumpen proletarian, I guess in a way you, you could think of it as people that are like outside of the proletarian relation. But the way that I normally think about it is that, you know, proles just have basically nothing but the shirt on their backs or at the very least, you know, their hustle or their job is their primary form of income. They don't have capital. That's what I normally think, and I and I normally don't, I normally don't distinguish between the wage form and the hustle that much because I feel like it obs- it sort of legalistically obscures the fact that they have no capital. Well, you, you also like, have to take into account like what the reserve army of labor is doing when they're not actually employed, right? Yeah, completely. Sorry. I think there's a thing of time in there. So, like, if it's like a crisis and you're unemployed, you're still pro. But if it's full employment and you make a living through, you know, preying on people, you know, pickpocketing or et cetera, I think that would be lump and proletariat. Like, I, I'm just looking here at, like, the definition of a galley slave. Like, you know, <laughs> like, so a lot of times... Right. Well, like these it galley slaves you got to look out for. Yeah, they're the bad ones. No, but, like, so the galley slave is a slave in a rowing galley, either a convicted criminal... Right, sentenced to work at the oar or a kind of human chattel off in the prisoner of war. Like in France, they were literally sometimes American, Native Americans who um, were like just chained up. Like there was 50 Iroquois chiefs Jesus. from Fort Frontenac to Marseille, France, used as galley slaves. So like there's a mix, like a lot of these, like say discharged soldiers, are like a, that's a, a very mixed, it's a very catch all thing. Isn't it like, you know, like there's discharged soldiers who get their leg blown off and then there's other ones who are discharged because they were fucking assholes and swindlers or something. So well, is it very... This way. Imagine a Marxist today being like, oh, those fucking lumpen who, you know, are escaped from prison, who are, you know, according to the Constitution, legally slaves because you can still be a slave as a punishment for a crime. Like, fuck those guys, right? Like... We wouldn't take that shit seriously. Those those thieving mm-hmm. looters, those rioters, those thugs. Right. I mean, those, those <laughs> no, scum. 
that I'm taking it on board. I'm just trying to give the argument. Like I do, I, I completely like, I, I completely take it. Like I'm trying to get at what, it, like, because obviously there is a class content to what the, the Decemberists were, for example, mm. and all the fucking shenanigans and stuff they were getting up to. Right. So it's like, we, we can't not do an analysis of who they are because they contain certain types of, peoples that we would feel bad about saying it contains do you know what i mean like at some point you have to do the fucking analysis right right right, right. No. mark uh, mark's definitely anything. kind of fucks it up what what about lumpen says anything that can't be accomplished through like surplus population surplus proletariat you know or or whatever or and because i don't think because the source as like an accurate source of like who is the class content that supports bonaparte it may be correct but this is so full of vitriol that like yeah. I kind of want to trust but verify or maybe slightly distrust and check. Yeah, th th well, I I would... the main thing that I don't like about this is that it undermines my trust in Marx's analysis here and that I now have to actually do the, instead of just having pamphlet brain and feeling smug about it, I actually have to go do the legwork. So thank you, Marx, for not being good all the time. <laughs> no, like that's 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 well, very fair. I, I think all those points are very fair. But like for one thing I would say why your description, uh, Esri, uh, wouldn't work is because some of these aren't a surplus proletariat or whatever. Some of these aren't. Like a brothel keeper is not, right? A literati isn't. Okay. Like but, a por then, like a porter isn't like I mean that's why I mean it's a weird yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's it, right but but why are they all in the same class category then right it, we actually that actually weakens Marx's argument more than strengthens it and I don't I don't think your your intention was to strengthen his argument but I think it just throws the whole category into further question well you know maybe there's you know like what lumpen petty bourgeoisie or whatever and or you know surplus petty bourgeoisie I, however you cut it like we have to change the class relation they have like, to bifurcate this like and distinguish between the pimp. Yeah and the sex worker yeah absolutely like it like it shouldn't be called lumpen proletariat it should be called just like lumpen whatever the fuck i don't know because it's like it has elements of petty bourgeois it has elements of like like god knows it's probably should be putting the fucking cops in here is there any I, cops <laughs> you know what i mean um well the, jay sakai the guy that wrote settlers who essentially claims that you know in his kind of memeified way that there's no white proletariat in the united states as he kind of aged, he did kind of look at cops as lumpen proletariat, which I thought was, you know, it's an interesting turn of phrase. It's an interesting turn of the moralism of the workers' movement tradition. Yeah, but it, de it definitely is full of moralism. Like, it, that's, that's to be undoubted. But um, I do think, like, you know, like, when Marx is doing his analysis, sometimes not all the classes are like, they're not, it's not like a Venn diagram. Some of them overlap. I would think the lumpen proletariat is not, from how is it described here, is not all contained within the proletariat. It's uh, an intersection. Like if you were to draw a Venn diagram, you'd have one, sorry, one for proletariat, one for petty bourgeois, and they're separate. And then you'd have like the lumpen proletariat, which intersects and contains both elements of both. This is something that you might call like a contradictory class location. When we talk about Eric Olin Wright, although this is part of his like earlier framework, like he does get into situations where, you know, people have multiple sources of income and they, they are a part of the Venn diagram. You know, maybe lumpen at some point would be a, a category worth looking at if you can like do, you know, concept surgery on it, reconstructive surgery, whatever. But like, yeah, it definitely is, needs some surgery. As, as is, this is like a, if you swap out lumpen for parasite, you basically have Marx's meaning. I almost want to say, like, in the Marxist tradition, if this is our starting point, and I think this is what the starting point of most people, even the new left, are kind of responding to this. I honestly think this whole category should kind of just be, like, tossed away and we should start over with something that's a little bit less. Yeah, because I think that, Ezri, when you're saying that if you replace this description of lumpen proletariat with parasite, it would be more accurate. I think that's exactly it. Like that actually resolves a lot of the questions that we have. Like, are they really proletarian? Blah, blah, blah. Like, is a literati really proletarian? Like, actually, if you just swap in parasite, like all those things disappear. And what Marx is saying, like, actually makes a lot more sense. Like you can understand his reasoning better if you remove the proletarian label and just put in parasite. Well, I the, don't think so. I don't it's think a good so. Movie. Yeah. Because if, would... you say, if you say parasite, right, 
How are you yeah. leaving out the fucking main class of capitalists? How are they not a parasite? So parasite is too broad. I think it has to be more specific. The other, right. the other, be- the because, other point I would make... Generally speaking, Tom, Marx tries to... Whenever he's deploying moralistic language, he normally, normally, he'll try to emulate the morals of the society. So the, the bourgeoisie, they're job creators. <laughs> you know, they're like the, the wage form exploits justly. Whereas these people, these are the unjust. These are the parasites. Even though we all know exploitation has moral. Marx but is I saying, th- oh, no, there's no, there's no moral content to it. I don't have any morality. I don't believe in justice. I don't believe in equality. That's not what I'm doing, even though I am. Like, but th- that's not what I'm doing. So I think, I think that's the angle there, is that this is something that the society also thinks is illegitimate forms of predation. Where surplus yeah. extraction, you can't have society without surplus extraction. When he says ruined and adventurous offshoots of the bourgeoisie, it kind of has some implications about the legitimacy of the bourgeoisie otherwise, right? That it's it's these like fail sons and disgraced people who uh, from the bourgeoisie who fall into this group. They're, you know, they're adventurers. They're not like, you know, legitimate business people. That's the, that's the, the connotations of what he's saying here. But, but also it's like, it's just people in, who work in like kind of semi, probably are criminal enterprises, you know, mafia types, gangsters, yeah, which, small gangsters, which, are which petty if, bourgeois on some level. Yeah. But what I'm, what I'm saying, Tom, is like that if we like actually remove the class analysis from this description and just look at it moralistically in terms of parasites, it's a lot more coherent. As, as it's presented, right? I, I think, think that's true. I think that it's interesting in that movie is that both the people that they work for, the you know bourgeois people that they work for, and the lumpen who's scamming them are both parasitic in their own right. It's kind of the point of that movie. You know, well, and the movie definitely sympathizes more with like the poor Lumpen family, but no spoilers, well, but it's, it gets rough. Yeah. Legitimacy is the key word. There's legitimate parasites that run society that are the foundation of every mode of production. And then there's this social scum. Right. I don't think it's a static class for one. And I, I don't actually think that it's, it's so much founded in uh, material conditions. If Trump was actually going to do a, a, a Louis Bonaparte, what would his equivalent lump and proletariat be? A lot of them would be actually workers. A lot of them would be racists. And I don't think that it's a static uh, lump. I think that if you were to look across different, like, kind of Bonapartist types, I think, like, there could be quite large differences within what would make up what Marx would call the lumpen. But, like, Napoleon had... December, slightly December, 10th people. But he, Napoleon also had general broad support in the population too. How do we split them apart? Yeah, uh, just to sort of give some kind of definite exp- or definite information about things that Napoleon, uh, that Louis Bonaparte did. For example, he started a jobs program once he was in power that was about, you know, reconstructing Paris and this did give him uh, quite a bit of popularity with workers, just as an example of, of how he was able to, to get support from people who were not, quote unquote, lumpen in that sense. Stank in the comments says, people who live off yeah, the that, wage fund that, without that's capital true. are proles, Puya. Yeah, so. yeah, that's, that's true. But um, like, I don't know how to uh, articulate Well, OK, it. but. Like let's let's take that logic a bit further then, and but, you get but, into but, the pro- but, you get into the problem of unproductive labor, right? Unproductive workers are then oh, lumpen. No, no, no. I think I think that I think that category is also like kind of BS. Like like if you're a worker that works in a grocery shop, shop you're productive. I think it's contingent <laughs> on the situation. Like I guess the, okay, something that pops into my mind is a W. E. B. Du Bois. You know, Black Reconstruction in America. He does the class breakdown of the American South and like, you know, poor whites, you know, they have a pretty shit time and they get hired as the slave overseers. Right. Like, and there's, you know, 
that's you know very contingent on their political situation, how progressive they are, right? Or in, or and even the economic situation. You know, they've been basically made obsolete in that point in time by slave labor, and are essentially surplus population. And when they are hired, they're basically hired to police other workers. Like what we're not being, what I'm not being clear of. I th about here, I think, is that this is how he's describing what the society of December 10th were made up of. So, like, when we're looking at Trump supporters, we're not looking at an equivalent because there is no society like this, you know, underground, you know, society who's actually doing lots of particular fucking underhand shit for Trump. Okay, like, like let's let's move on. Unless anybody has, wants to have the last talk, I've, I've said a lot here. Uh, I'm not making a case that... <laughs> I agree with this paragraph. I'm just trying to interrogate it before uh, I get I get cancelled by Esri and Sophia. I think the main point to take away here is that Marx is making a pretty simple point in this chapter. He's saying that Louis Napoleon is the chief of the lumpen proletariat who are parasites on society, and he is the great parasite who is exploiting France. Like, it's a very simple moralistic point, and that's really the substance of what he's suggesting here. Like, as, as your average pickpocket preys on the average worker, so too does Louis Bonaparte prey on the entire nation of France. All right. Yeah. If, if we're going to charitably read Marx's rape joke from the first chapter, I think we can look at this and kind of crack open the rational kernel here. That makes sense. Like, I, I, I'm not saying that that is an adequate analysis. I'm just saying that's that's like what he's saying about Louis Bonaparte by making so much hay out of the lumpen proletariat. Like, he's kind of appealing to people's moralism. Okay, we're going to move on and actually do some new stuff this time. Let's see how many French words there are in here and see who we can get to read it, because we can't give it to the two Southern Hicks. Kyle, do you want to kick it off? You're usually good for kicking them off. Uh, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> uh, as a farmer hick myself, and a Calgarian, which which many Canadians would characterize as a hick, I, I will uh, carry on here. So we have talked about the way in which Bonaparte used the desire for order among the bourgeoisie and the party of order against them. He prevented them from actually bringing anything to open conflict by using their own words, by demanding tranquility, and thereby uh, sidestepping his own possible involvement in an assassination plot. So here we go. At last, towards the end of December, guerrilla warfare began over a number of prerogatives of Parliament. The movement got bogged down in petty squabbles about the prerogatives of the two powers since the bourgeoisie had done away with the class struggle for the moment by abolishing universal suffrage. Sorry for jumping in, but I just want to highlight that sentence. The bourgeoisie did away with the class struggle for a moment by abolishing universal man suffrage. This is where Marx is at with class struggle and, and democracy at this point. Anyway, moving on. Okay. A judgment for debt had been obtained from the court against Mao Guin, one of the people's representatives. In answer to the inquiry of the president of the court, the minister of justice, Guel, declared that a copious should be issued against the debtor without further ado. Moguin was thus thrown into debtor's prison. The National Assembly flared up when it learned of the assault. Not only did it order his immediate release, but it even had him fetch forcibly from Clichy the same evening by its clerk. In order, however, to confirm its faith in the sanctity of private property, and with the idea at the back of its mind of opening, in case of need, a place of safe safekeeping, for Montagnards who had become troublesome, it d declared imprisonment of people's representatives for debt permissible when its consent had previously been obtained. It forgot to decree that the president might also be locked up for debt. 
it destroyed the last semblance of the immunity that enveloped the members of its own body. And this is why no one in Congress is ever tried for crimes. Correct. This is this is why in, insider trading is legal now. I think it's actually technically legal at this stage in America. Uh, so f- for members of Congress, as far as I understand, insider trading was previously legal, but Obama put in some rules against it, which is why it became a bit of a controversy when people like Pelosi... Uh, Pelosi's husband were profiting off of uh, sort of insider information at the dawn of this crisis. Yeah. So one thing here to note is that uh, Clichy is the debtor's prison in France and also a former uh, right fullback for Arsenal and French football international here. Uh, so what do people make of this? Like we we see that they, they basically just screwed themselves over. They've just weakened themselves. It shows that their real enemy, even though they had dismissed the power of the the revolutionary classes, the social democrats or whatever, even though they got rid of of them, they still see them as their main enemy, even though they're about to like get totally destroyed by Bonaparte as a class they, they're their priority, and they're they're willing even to weaken their own political power, like the political class is willing to weaken their own political power against the executive because their real enemy is the left. If I recall correctly, later on, it, that, that dynamic kind of shifts to where you got the party of order kind of warping as Republicans, and they fo- shift their focus on fighting Bonaparte more. And I think you kind of see similar dynamics play throughout history, but usually that happens far too late. And so I think we're seeing like the first kind of stage of that, perhaps. Like right now, they're focused on the wrong thing. They're focused on like, and this makes sense, right? They want to make sure they can continue to exploit the working class, that's not real. where the real threat is for them. But I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I'm not sure how I think of, feel about it. Like, do is, like, the way to think about Bonaparte here, like, it's, like, a, an autocrat who is good for the bourgeoisie. It just kind of, like, more or less kind of lessens their political power, but they still maintain their social power. Is that kind of why in, like, Germany, and obviously Bonapartism isn't the same as fascism, but... To kind of see something that rhymes with that, in Germany you had some of the bourgeoisie trying to stop Hitler. I mean, far too late, obviously, but they had they they were a part of some plots at certain points. Maybe it's just because they simply wanted to have say in government, and they didn't anymore. You know, I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing. So, just getting to Esri's point here, I'll bring it up again then. That since the bourgeoisie had done away with the class struggle for the moment by abolishing universal suffrage. I think the point that Marx is making here is that like they got beat on the street and then their the struggle went went into the parliament for a while and then they basically defeated them on the parliament too. Yeah. He's not making and, the case that it's gone that's it's only in voting where the class struggle is from now on or anything. The point that she was making to me last night was more along the lines of like we were talking about like ultra leftism and all that and how you could, you could try as you might to divorce Marx from like his focus on electoral strategy, but you see it as early as, as in this book where he is referring to political struggle as a central component of class struggle. You know, it's not the only thing in, in Marx, but it's like a it's like a key thing. It's a key part of it. And he could be wrong, honestly. And I, I, I'm kind of inclined, I don't think of myself as an ultra leftist, but I think like we were really like going back and forth on this. And I think finding some kind of center left strategy for me is kind of what I want to do. Like, I don't think in using center left as like a, in the McNair sense, I don't think focusing a lot of effort on elections, even in, in countries that don't have first past the post is like a really viable method in my opinion. But I think using election strategically as a way to like boost your party's presence is okay yeah i I definitely think that i don't think electoralism is gonna work in the u.s especially it seems to be very unpopular with the people that you'd probably be pulling off of as your base of support uh yeah i mean the, the the situation at this point in france is that like when the montagne 
was interacting with the rest of parliament, like it was a very acrimonious relationship, right? And like oftentimes you saw the fight in parliament being related to a fight in the street. The parliamentary struggle was kind of obviously related to what was happening in society in general. And so I don't think it's it's that surprising that Marx sees that, you know, the Montaigne being defeated in Parliament was representative of like a crushing of the proletarian side in, in the class struggle in general. You know, whereas now it's kind of like the political sphere in America is just way out of touch. In, in a similar way to what the uh, party of order established once they did crush the Montaigne, right? That the, the struggle between Bonaparte and the party of order was a political struggle that was largely divorced from the social. It became a, a battle of who will represent the bourgeoisie. Yeah, I think Sophia basically like fairly represented my point. There is a slight turn around the Paris Commune towards like alternative forms or whatever. But in terms of Marx's theory of how dictatorship of the proletariat is established and what the class struggle ultimately entails, you know, Marx is, of course, interested in economic activity and strikes and that sort of thing. And I'm sure if he could see our, our situation, he would appreciate the role of riots and the class struggle and that sort of thing. But ultimately for Marx, what makes a transition to communism plausible is the proletariat like wresting the state from the bourgeoisie in some way to destroy it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read the next bit then. It will be remembered that acting on the information given by a certain L.A., police commissioner Jan had denounced a section of the Decemberists for planning the murders of Dupin and Changarnier. In reference to this, at the very first session, the Quaestors made the proposal that Parliament should form a police force of its own, paid out of the private budget of the National Assembly and absolutely independent of the police prefect. The Minister of, of the Interior, Baroche, protested against this invasion on his domain. A miserable compromise in this matter was concluded, according to which, true, the police commissioner of the Assembly was to be paid out of its private budget and to be appointed and dismissed by its quaestors but only after previous agreement with the Minister of the Interior. Meanwhile, the government had started criminal proceedings against Alé, and here it was easy to represent his information as a hoax, and through the mouth of the public prosecutor to cast ridicule upon Dupin, Changarnier, Yon, and the whole National Assembly. Thereupon, on December 29th, Minister Baroche writes a letter to Dupin, in which he demands Yon's dismissal. The Bureau of the Assembly, alarmed by its violence in the Mauguin affair and accustomed when it has ventured a blow to the executive to receive two blows from it in return, does not sanction this decision. It dismisses Jan as a reward for his official zeal and robs itself of a parliamentary prerogative indispensable against a man who does not decide by night in order to execute by day, but decides by day and executes by night. So we're going to get into a lot of this in shenanigans today with all the ins and outs of what's going on. So essentially what's happened here is that there was a plot by the Decemberists to kill, you know, Dupin and Changarnier. And Jan was the police commissioner who was actually looking into it. But they, the, the parliament didn't back up Jan. They never interrogated it as they were supposed to do it in parliament. They never set up the commission in parliament that was going to uh, look at all of this stuff. And when they backed down on that, it, it allowed Napoleon and his uh, ministers to make it out as all being a crazy plot to basically get rid of who were actually their enemies in the National Assembly. So, like, the party of order just seems to be stripping away every goddamn piece of actual machinery they could use to defend themselves bit by bit. It, it's kind of insane. Tranquility. France demands tranquility. That is true. That, that's a very good point. That, that is it. I, I really like this last line. It dismisses Jan as a reward for his official zeal and robs itself 
of a parliamentary prerogative indispensable against a man who does not decide by night in order to execute by day, but decides by day and executes by night. <laughs> Very he, ominous. Seriously. He, he's always doing these little one-liner switches where he just reverses the causality. It's a very good kind of a, of a writing style, a theatrical kind of motif or something. It reminds yeah. me of, there was a British Tory leader, is it Michael Howard, and one of his fellow Tories ministers described him as saying something like, there was something of the night about him. And he kind of did look slightly vampirish. It, it really stuck. It, this line just really reminds me of it. Nobody here remembers Michael Howard, do they? He was the Who's one like before. It? He was the leader before David Cameron. Holy oh, shit! No, I don't. Wow, I, I I actually forgot he existed. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.